about the unorganized sector in India. So, what is actually this unorganized sector? It is that sector which is not registered with the government and it has no fixed rules and regulation regarding employment. So, this sector is considered as unorganized sector. It includes all the small size uh, enterprises, the workshops where there are low skill and unproductive employment. So, basically the training and uh, the human capital involved are very uh, low on parameters. We have about 450 million people uh, that is around 94% of all workers in India that belong to this category. So, and another point is that informal organizations are major players in activities such as manufacturing, construction, transport, trade, hotels, etc. All these uh, together contribute to about one third of the GDP and a peculiar feature is that such enterprises don't work towards uh, increasing their profits they work towards uh, having a uh, livelihood, earning a livelihood and these people uh, educate their children, feed their families. So basically, invisibly they are, uh, uh, they play a major role in development of the nation. They might not be getting the benefits uh, because of the, they will not be getting those benefits. So uh, by proxy they are kind of unregistered because they are not getting the benefits of being registered. They may not be registered most of them. Okay. Moreover, they are not registered anywhere, which may not be true. And how do you know they are unproductive always? I suppose they are low skill and unproductive. Where we found it, there is unproductive. Moreover, they concentrate more heavily towards their employment. Uh, so, it is as such that they do not care about uh, profits and all. So, from where you got access? So, that is from NCEO's website. What is this website? NCEO's? National, uh, yeah, National Council for Employment in uh, Anarchism. Not always, not always, but like uh, due to low human capital base and low skills, so uh, productivity is low. Productivity is low. Because you are saying they are always, no? they, they are low. Those who are giving definition, please ensure that you know the source. Because I'm just defining the right on your pata on the data from where it's coming. Now we'll talk about the classification of uh, unorganized labor. So as per the Ministry of Labor, uh, unorganized labor can be uh, classified in terms of uh, these four things. First of all is the term uh, in terms of occupation. So they may be small uh, farmers, uh, agricultural laborers, fishermen or BD rolling and all. And in terms of nature of employment, they can be either uh, casual labor, contract la labor, migrant workers, etc. And then we can also classify them in terms of uh, specially distressed categories. So this includes the toddy tappers, the scavengers, the carriers of head loads and drivers, etc. And the final category is in terms of service categories. So these include the midwives, the domestic workers, fishermen, women, barbers, vegetables, etc. Apart from these also, there are a lot of categories that are not... Uh, uh, really uh, a, a, cat, a broad category in themselves but uh, cobblers, carpenters and all can also be classified in any one of these categories. So uh, why large informal economy in India? So why, why is it so that India has such a uh, large amount of unorganized uh, sector? So uh, this roots from uh, the ancient India. So we had this scripture known as Arthaved. So there Vishwakarma, that is a lord of workers, is put at a very supreme position and all the labors are now considered to be its descendant. So that way, uh, uh, in the ancient era, they, the workers were considered and always seen with dignity. So again, uh, there was a notion of dignity of labor and glory of work that was always present in the ancient Indian society. And again, the social, uh, the social structure that existed before uh, in the ancient times, the caste based system was there and it was predominantly based on the utility and, and the kind of work the workers were doing and it was not based on heritage. So it was always a matter of, uh, it was uh, never a matter of pride and all, it was strictly based on what they are doing.
and finally there was a uh, uh, presence of strict code of conduct as was uh, described in mimamsa so because of that code being present the workers could autonomously work and they could have contacts and they knew that their rights were being protected so that way there was no need earlier to actually go for uh, formalization and uh, industrialization uh, and uh, another reason that contributes to such a large informal economy in india is the landscape and the nature of indian labor at onset uh, at the onset of colonialization that is with the british rule so before british uh, the mughal rulers were ruling and there were complete absence of technological innovations in the uh, agriculture sector so whatever innovation whatever little innovations were there they were mostly in the uh, weaving industry and textile industry so that's why they were, and india was predominantly an agricultural economy so those uh, large base of workers always remained uh, unorganized and they could never formalize and then the imposition of tax collection by british and reluctance to uh, invest in industrialization so because of this reluctance they could uh, never form a uh, formal group another reason would be the poor development policies after uh, we got independence so those can include the caste politics that were that has been always faced when uh, played in india uh, by the by whatever party that is ruling caste politics has always been a major hindrance towards the development and formalization of uh, rural indian sectors and then there were mass scale rural to urban migration and politics of dispossession another reason would be the ineffective industrialization of agriculture and te textile um, sector so when we got independence these were the like majority of people were employed in either agriculture or textile sector but after independence the government didn't work on formalizing these sectors and they focused instead on the more capital intensive sectors like steel and all so because if i am opening a new enterprise then my not a company no. at your own level yeah if it is my at my own level then it is it will be informal so it means the company would have to work it also depends upon uh, how many neighbors have you employed say four five people yes, then, and then it need not be then there is to be so nothing like that is complete <laughs> so generally the basic features of unorganized sectors are uh, marked by there is a low level of uh, uh, means it starts at a low level generally they are small scale and uh, the number of uh, workers are generally less than 10 and there is heterogeneity of activities because there uh, the generally small scale uh, industries or small uh, small scale units are not process driven so uh, there is no homogeneous process which uh, uh, the workers follow and there is heterogeneity on the basis of skills as well as the uh, work that they do then easy entry easier entry and exit than in formal sector uh, this is due to uh this point that uh, the labor relations are based on casual employment and uh, there is there there is no proper registration uh of the of your enterprise even if there is a registration then it is not strictly implemented and uh, uh, like we said that even if it is registered uh, legally but the registrations or contracts are not properly then there is minimal capital and there is little or no division of between labor and capital labor relations are based on casual employment employment and or social uh, or social relationship based on your community driven and not uh, based on uh, formal co contracts workers in the informal sectors are largely unaware of their rights uh, this is again due to uh, generally low level of literacy and uh, they don't know uh, like which organization to resort to in case of uh, exploitation then uh this includes like uh, this self employment in informal uh, this unorganized sector may include this self employment in informal as well as unregistered enterprises or wage based employment uh, which we see as uh, the seasonal employment or daily wages uh, which is mainly in the industries like construction so um, if we see the prominence of uh, informal employment has been one of the central features of labor market scenario so here if we see the uh, this is the labor force in a million in generally uh, non agricultural sectors 
so if we see this has increased over the years in 2004 to uh, from 2004 to 5 to 2011 12 this has uh, increased in manufacturing sector in manufacturing sector and construction sector it has almost doubled here and in many uh, industries like uh, uh, their trade hotel and which is mainly marked by uh, uh, our self-employed people or uh, which is mainly unorganized sector here and other sectors like education health uh, these have also uh, gone up so as you can see there is a marked increase from 160 million to 204 million from uh, over the years so again like uh, over the past decade we have seen that uh, in the for in the organized sector the employment has uh, it has slightly increased or there is no growth at all but in the in terms of employment but in the organized sector there is a, a faster growth as compared to the organized sector and there is a low productivity syndrome so efficiency has always been lower than the formal sector may be attributed to lower real wages that they get and poor working conditions and uh, there is seasonality of employment like in construction industries we have seen that uh, the construction workers generally uh, are uh, uh, hired for maybe 3 4 months and they are generally daily wage workers there is a poor human capital base in terms of uh, their there is no formal training has been for, uh, formal training is provided to them and uh, generally temporary and part-time part -time employment uh, resorted to uh, absence of worker mobilization and organized collective bargaining so uh, there is like if we see in a uh, uh, generally organized sector there is a, there are labor unions there are organizations uh, uh, which can put their uh, rights in front of the management but here there is a, a lack means there are some organizations uh, but uh, due to lack of uh, uh, their knowledge about their rights there is no such a, a collective organization against uh, the exploitation which happens here we can see that the pro, uh, it it provides employment as we have seen that 90 percent of the workforce is employed in almost an unorganized sector and if we see the uh, distinction here, uh, like the self-employed people or uh, regular wage salary so they at a uh, disaggregated level so uh, the self-employed uh, the uh, unorganized sector employment has increased over over the years in mainly in casual labor here from 31.16 percent to 32.57 that is 132.81 million to 141.91 uh, million and to, uh, total informal workforce if you have uh, uh, the percentage has uh, decreased here uh, but it has almost remained at a very high rate around 91.78 uh, percent uh, normal informal workforce then contribution to national income uh, if we if you look at the national domestic product so uh, the contribution of the unorganized sector is around 57.5 percent of the ndp and uh, again at a disaggregated level unorganized sector so uh, majority of the uh, if you look at the percentage of share of ndp so uh, main portion of it is in uh, agriculture and agriculture as well as this uh, services sector also forms a major portion so 39.12 of the NDP is uh, given by this agriculture as, as well as the services sector of the NDP uh, but in workforce uh, workforce space uh, industry forms a major portion and uh, if we see at the disaggregated level again so uh, in in terms of agriculture there is agriculture forestry and fish, uh, logging and fishing in terms of industry there is mining querying manufacturing uh, so this is the disaggregated level like in, in if agriculture is 100 percent then agriculture forms of 85 percent of that uh, ndp so now we will talk about uh, service unorganized sector in the service domain so if you can if you can see uh, unorganized sector provides uh, most of the jobs in service domain like around 27.7 million people and most of which are from the rural areas and one point which uh, needs your attention is the uh, sector, the complete sector is service, unorganized service sector is growing with 12.7 percent, but the employment is just increasing with, uh, you know, growing with uh, 0.7 percent in the particular sector. So there are basically six sectors which are generating a very pro productive employment, accounts for 16 percent of the un unorganized sector, which gives the gross value added of around 43.6 percent. So you can see the sector telecommunication, the employment and the increase has been around 15.14 and software publishing sector supporting auxiliaries and transport services, post and courier activities. So you can see there were two jobless growth, jobless means the uh, number of jobs are uh, uh, not increasing, jobs are not Im improving and job losing sectors where a job are, jobs are actually decreasing in that particular sector. So job losing sectors are, you can see the figures as well. 
restaurant restaurants and canteens other services so and so other education motion legal legal accounting bookkeeping and all so in those those cases the law of, uh, absolute increase in the improvements had has been reduced till now and with the, there is the stagnant growth or jobless jobless gro growth is the business activities higher education and to total then total of the unorganized sector has been a positive means like uh, in absolute term the employment has been increasing overall next slide so there are few declining sectors as well where the uh, this uh, unorganized sector growth rate is increasing in these of the sectors so uh, sectors such as land transport senior and education renting the personal households and all this there had uh, negative growth has been seen in in both as well as in both gross value added as well as the particular uh, employment as well so together four sectors employed around 7.3 million workers uh, three point works in 2006 and 7 and 1.1 million worker less than employed in 2010 2001 and 2 so the four sectors that we, we are referring to is land other than other land and transport so there is an absolute decrease if you see decrease of 630.7 in secondary and senior education also there is decrease so uh, manufacturing so uh, manufacturing is also on we have unorganized manufacturing sector as well which constitutes around 20, 85% of the total manufacturing employment which contributes to 22% of the output so output is very less but the sector which is involved in this are quite much small small in, steel industries you can see which are doing forging and all you can see such industries of manufacturing industries like that so there are if you see the data there are furniture general purpose machineries the chemical products so there are productive employment sectors which are actually quite productive so employment has been this much and there has been absolute increase in that particular data but if you see the labor productivity decline sectors in which the labor has been declined that is beverages and paper and products and paper and paper products so six sub sectors are there which are declining from 2001 to 2006 and that there has been negative growth has been seen the total of these sector accounted for around 1.69 million jobs which which are losing people are losing so product of goods what the various product of goods fish uh, fisheries of fruits and vegetables printing service sectors and there is been negative growth means like in in terms of employment so while we're talking about the issues in the uh, unorganized sector so most of these is, uh, issues are actually vicious in circle so uh, because because there are insufficient labor laws so uh, there is less social security again uh, there will be minimum wages and uh, and and, uh, and and that that would again lead to the child labor and and that uh, uh, enhances because of the poor uh, work conditions it would lead to uh, diseases uh, so it is uh, even uh, what actually happens is even if there are laws so uh, uh, like what people generally do is they try to circumvent those laws they try to avoid those laws by by employing labor uh, by employing labor on contractual basis so uh, then, then what so happens is that most of these laws they become voidable Uh, so i'll be talking about the uh, sectoral problem so in agricultural uh, sector while agricultural sector it contributes to around 20% to gdp and 50 uh, 57% uh, in employment uh, it has seasonal employment that is around uh, like people are employed uh, for about say uh, roughly around 197 days a year low wages uh, again this varies from uh, state to state but uh, yeah so uh, now here you can see the wages that has changed uh, uh, like Uh, in uh, from 2010 to uh, to uh, to 2012 uh, in three financial years so while it has uh, the lowest in agricultural was around some 77.1 in 2012 and the highest was uh, around 170 but on an but in total it was uh, anyways less than 300 similar was the case in uh, in the non agricultural sector as well here also the the maximum the maximum wage was around 293.6 this was in 2012 13 however uh, we, we see a, a good growth uh, there's there's a continuous growth happening uh, in the in all these sectors yeah yeah so this is uh, 20 uh, 2010 11 2011 12 and 2012 13 and uh, like and uh, this is for different uh, different activities like the higher ones are the are for the men and the lower ones are the, uh, are for women so uh, like for sewing uh, in 2012 it was 177 but it decreased for women so that is why there is that curve of up down curve this chart we got it uh, from the uh, annual survey of industries so uh, like this is the latest data so uh, for the uh, this was available till financial year 2013 uh, 
so uh, we could get this uh, even because they take some uh, there will be some time lag so this was only to uh, but this was only to Mm -hmm. so, the years, that's not happening. Sir, for over the years, but I have shown. So, what is the connection between one and the other? Okay, okay, take it. Okay. Uh, the only intention was to show that it is changing across years. Ah, oh, but that's not connecting. Yeah, yeah, like because we connected it. Yeah, yeah. We'll change that, sir. Actually, what should be connected is the year. Yeah, uh, say. Particular year and then there is a rise, etc. Rise, dikhi nahi raha. Ah, that is. Yes. I understand. And this is for the uh, child labor statistics. So, uh, you can see that uh, in e uh, economic activities, around four percentage of the total children were employed, and uh, this was for. Uh, 2012 uh, like uh, data so uh, the total children who were uh, uh, who were employed is around 6.75 6 uh, and the other 67.44 uh, were attending schools uh, uh, like during that period of time and most of the boys were employed in economic activities and the girls were employed in domestic activities or uh, most of them were again were either uh, not attending or were not at school so as said by dr r vaidyanathan the policies of government uh, is pursuing could well render unemployable uh, all those who are self-employed now. So even after having a large share in NDP, uh, we have seen that there is 57% share of the unorganized sector in NDP. The government policies are hardly uh, benevolent towards the informal entrepreneurs. And since the private sector executives uh, like editors in English language newspapers and bureaucrats who generally speak about the issues and who are the policy formulators those are from the employee groups they are not really thinking about the self employed uh, uh, sector so we can see from the data that uh, the gross domestic saving by private and public sector so, so in this data the unorganized sector is under the household sector so uh, we can see from the uh, table we can easily see that uh, the household sector is around the 67 consists of around 67% of the total gross domestic saving and in that also the unorganized sector consists of 70% of the uh, household sector uh, so, and from the table we can see that it's decreasing year on year uh, though it contributes a lot into the national saving uh, the amount of credit they are getting from the banks it's very less uh, is, so if we can see from this table from uh, March 90 to till 2002 it's decreased from 58 to 43 and from 43 uh, in 2016 is decreased to 42 percent so those though these sectors are contributing a lot to the gdp ndp but still they are not getting the credits for their businesses and uh, to, to expand the business and to start the businesses so so uh, in this uh, we can see that uh, the f out of 56 million of the total uh, in the uh, enterprises there are 52 million who are from the private uh, proprietary uh, from the private area and uh, out of that agriculture activities are uh, around 13 million uh, sorry 1 point so, uh, 13 million and uh, non agriculture activities contribute 40, 45 million so though the there is high number of uh, people uh, who are uh, in the self employed area they are getting very less credit from the banks and therefore 93 percent of those are self financed so they are not so this speaks volume about our credit delivery system is not for the self-employed groups and particularly belong to the so these sections are vulnerable sections so instead of fostering credit delivery at affordable cost and enhancing self-employment the policy planners are keen to create a huge mass of unemployable persons by the their policies we can see that uh, uh, when the technology changes the people who were empl employed earlier they are not skilled enough to uh, go along with the new technology they are not skilled enough to uh, enact with the new technology so they those self employed people gets converted into the unemployed people unemployable people so government has a responsibility to uh, teach them the skills so that they can be uh, they, they can get the employment so these are the some improvements required in organized unorganized sector social security scheme for the unorganized sector so the social security act is there 
so government has responsibility to uh, uh, apply that and uh, create eye on that credit facilities to be made available for the informal sector to start new business as well as to expand their current businesses government should resolve the grievances and the publicity of various social welfare schemes like uh, minimum wage scheme so uh, there is there are schemes from the government but people are not that aware about those schemes so there should be there is need of publicity of such schemes so enforcement of equal wages for men and women we have seen in the rural areas and in agricultural sector though men and women do similar work but still women get lesser wage as compared to the men so there is need of such uh, enforcement of such things uh, representation of the local self governing institution uh, occupation rights of house sites uh, representation of agricultural labors in the nation commission of on rural labor so that they can put their point uh, educating the children uh, uh, female children and women so that they they will get the their rights their actual wage and we have seen that those self help groups are for the men and women we have seen that in many areas they are only formed by women so there is need to include men as well in sh shg uh, in a small small uh, we have seen the small small shops and vendors those they just start their business they don't uh, they do not have any identity card and there are many repercussions of that like uh, they some uh, uh, government people like we can take the example of police take hafta from them and even they don't contribute to the income of the uh, municipality so we can we should allot allot them the photo identity card and there is need of uh, provision of drinking water toilets waste collection and temporary or permanent structure of for vendors so how does india fare across its international counterparts in the in this kind of an organized sector so if we see india is uh, by far the most restrictive employment protection laws for collective dismissals so what it does mean is that in india for manufacturing firms to lay off more than 100 workers they need permission basically and when we see that 87% of the indian manufacturing firms have fewer than 10 employees so that is a major restriction on those firms whereas if we, we see that only 5% of these kind of firms are uh, there in china when it has a large manufacturing sector so we can see that why india is not doing that well in an organized sector so it is basically uh, they uh, give a index basically uh, rating it from 0 to 6 so how much employment restriction restrictive employment protection is there uh, so india is fair india is basically worst in this chart across all of these countries so basically uh, the point i'm saying is uh, if you are saying that you have to take permission to lay off more than 100 workers but these kind of laws are not available in other countries so it gives a restriction to those manufacturing firms uh, to basically uh, 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 contribute towards the uh, productive uh, to create some kind of productive uh, work basically because if they have such kind of restriction then they, so if we compare it to, uh, for example, China, so 87% uh, of employment is in uh, firms with fewer than uh, 10 employees. So all of these firms will have to take some kind of permission from the government that uh, we want to lay off these kind of uh, these workers uh, if they want to lay off these workers. So they won't be able to, uh, uh, they won't be that productive uh, uh, if we see China, which has only 5% of the firms which have only less, uh, fewer than 10 employees. I'm not aware of all of these parameters that they have used in this index, but... Uh, no, no, index me. Last, last line. So, see, small firms cannot reap economies of scale. Uh, so, basically, uh, our exploit latest technology so suffer from lower productivity. So, if I am a manufacturer, if so if I am a manufacturing firm and I want to expand, so I will look into the case where I need to hire more than 100 workers. But I know that if I in future if I need to lay off more than 100 workers, then there will be some kind of problem for me. So what I will do is I will try to uh, avoid those kind of problems and I would remain in those small sectors where I need only less than 10 workers. So that's where I am being discouraged from going to those uh, economics of scale. Why firms may not want to grow. Uh, that is the reason. But your claim, you are not claiming that. It is, it is small. It says that that's why firms don't You are saying that's why they have low productivity. From where you get Because they are not able to reap economics of scale because of this discouragement. So, how do you know that? They are not really, they are not low productivity. Okay. So, it is because they are unable to, like, other than it grows, so it can easily access other markets. 
but because they are small in number, so they cannot act as those big bigger markets. So they they just remain wherever they are, or uh, or limited to that only uh, small geography. So without the data, we are but productivity low. How do you know? Productivity is different thing. You know the formula of productivity. So output by input. Somebody is small means unproductive. How do you know? That's my question. We are saying that we are finding some kind of logical conclusion where if they are not able to reap the benefits of economies of scale, then they won't be able to. That we can say, say, say uh, in terms of say uh, agriculture, they employ fifty-seven, uh, they give around fifty-seven percent of total income, but then uh, contribution to GDP is only twenty percent. So uh, they, here you can see that while you yeah, have but agriculture is there are other issues related because agriculture you can't compare with industry and say they have low productivity now. So we are not saying that all of these. Apple to apple comparison होना चाहिए ना. Is there any company doing agriculture versus a small farmer? Then you can compare. The point is we are not saying. Agriculture को industry से compare करे और बोल रहे हो कि agriculture low productivity. वो तो पता ही है. But now question is which the organizer or organizer or which industry में possible है? Because you have organized players, you have unorganized players. Sir, if we have two cases, in one case, let's say we don't give this kind of restriction to manufacturing firms, and the another case, if we provide this kind of restriction, now all other factors are the same. So, if we have to make some kind of logical conclusion that uh, if all other factors are same, and we are giving the permission to manufacturing firms that they can lay off more than hundred workers, so if they see that they might have some kind of productivity by economies of scale, they will go for that option. We are making that uh, logical conclusion from this statement. Productivity issue, but how do you know the productivity is low? But they won't. Now such models are coming. Earlier it was required that all software can be used only by big companies. Now it's not necessary. It's But they need to justify that ROI for using that uh, software if they have fewer than ten employees. I don't know exactly about SAP, but most of the software is now being made available right on the cell phones. I'm not saying SAP, but many of the software. Okay, maybe we can talk about the smaller overall. one will be more productive because they get workers when they want. Abhi tum suddenly labor ka idam ye mat bolo ki oh so laborers suffer. You only discuss about industry or discuss about labor at a time. But what I am saying is because these laborers they are not that skilled, so they take them for a limited period of time, and then after that they fire them, so they will not get that uh, necessary skill. As in that leads to uh, less productivity. Ah, but that means what? That layoff has nothing to do with less productivity. You are saying they have less skills, so they might have yes, less productivity. So, uh, if we uh, historically uh, agriculture has been a large contributor to the GDP of India, but it has been reducing over the years. But still, if we compare it to the other countries, the uh, contribution in India GDP comes around to be seventeen point eight three percent, and Uh, it is one of the sectors where there is a lot of uh, unorganized uh, uh, employment, basically. So, if we compare it across other countries, then we can see that India is still not faring that well. And if we look at the uh, retail, in, India is still not faring that well compared to other countries where they are trying to reduce their G contribution of agriculture in their GDP. 
but still other uh, comparable countries like Russia, South Africa, and uh, the percentage of the whole uh, across the whole GDP. Maybe the absolute value will be increasing, but the percentage uh, in the whole GDP has been reducing over the years. In the retail sector, basically, this include local corner shops, honor men, general stores, pan beauty shops, and convenience stores. Basically, so again, here we see that in an unorganized organized sector is very less in Indian. Unorganized sector is quite large in India compared to other countries like China, Indonesia, Thailand, U.S., Taiwan, Malaysia. So this is basically chart of informal uh, employment across uh, various countries. So if we see that lot of developing and uh, transition economies, basically they have large amount of this informal employment, and uh, uh, there are uh, if uh, the formal labor market is typically uh, which has lot of benefits like uh, collective bargaining agreements and entitlements to these institution recognized benefits. But on average, seventy percent of labor force is beyond this reach of protection, uh, protection because of this informal employment. And these are the uh, few laws in this organized sector which uh, try to provide these benefits to these uh, in uh, the uh, employer em uh, employees in this unorganized sector. But only eight percent of the workers are actually able to uh, uh, get this benefits, and the reasons are basically they they are basically not organized and they do not have that kind of bargaining power if they are not being provided with these kind of benefits and then don't have any kind of social security system which has been devised to meet the needs of these workers and one of uh, that act is unorganized worker social security act of 2008 and basically it redefines workers to include all type of workers and not only those which only have a fixed employer and it gives every worker a unique social uh, security number and social security card and again it the benefits included in, in this are health insurance maternity benefits and pensions and other benefits and it binds the central government of pro to providing minimum amount of benefits uh, and fund for uh, these workers. Uh, they are able to only eight percent of the workers are able to uh, get those benefits. So they are, so sir. Basically, uh, these are uh, the reasons. So, act they exist today only apply to workers who have a clear employer-employee relationship. Next, next slide. It redefines workers to include all type of workers, not only those who have. So it uh, Not only those who have fixed right? But that 8% is for those previous acts that I showed in the last slide. So, this is a newer law, you should provide more data. I'm uh, apart from. Not in the 2014 data, data. data. I'm not saying that those 8% workers after this act, uh, for those acts, only 8% of workers were getting those benefits. Uh, that's so, why. The that so for uh, for that for that I am not saying that eight percent of the workers are getting benefits. I am saying. So, so I am saying say something. Na, you are doing project on the area. Okay. The okay. Of Fine, sir. I just go back. Go back. That I want to see that. On the labor ka kuch ek hai na. Ha ha. Now you are contradicting what you written here and you are contradicting what you written there. How sir? See, India by far is the most restrictive employment protection laws. Yes sir. That means it's difficult to lay off or it's easy to lay off? It is difficult to lay off because no, you need no, permission. Going, no. That's what I'm saying. That's what it's In not. this index. No. This index way it is showing that the, employment is or worse? the higher score says that you have a restrictive collective uh, dismissal uh, laws, but the lower uh, score shows that you don't have that kind of restriction in collective dismissals. So, so it is more restrictive. Huh, so for India, it is more restrictive. The index shows that. So uh, to conclude, so informal economy is huge in India in terms of contribution to its uh, national income as well as employment and. Most of the significant labor in this organized sector is basically in manufacturing, construction, trade, transport. And the most uh, uh, prominent characterizations are lower wages, seasonal employment, casual contractual employment, absence of social security measures, and negation of social standards. And because of lower education and lower skill levels, it makes them more, more vulnerable to uh, exploitation and some improvements required are through social security are done through social security schemes self help groups and legislation against child labor and again uh, we reiterate the point that need, need some kind of fair access to credit when they are providing such kind of large contribution to the indian gdp 
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी सो द टॉपिक ऑफ आवर प्रेजेंटेशन वुड बी मार्केट बेस्ड इकोनॉमिक मॉडल वर्सेस बैंक बेस्ड इकोनॉमिक मॉडल दीज आर द फॉलोइंग टॉपिक्स दैट वी विल बी कवरिंग सो व्हाट इज एक्चुअली अ कैपिटल बेस्ड मॉडल व्हाट आर इट्स कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स एडवांटेजेस एंड डिसएडवांटेजेस देन विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट बैंक बेस्ड मॉडल इट्स ओरिजिन इट्स एडवांटेजेस एंड डिसएडवांटेजेस देन विल टॉक अबाउट लिंक बिटवीन रियल जीडीपी ग्रोथ पर कैपिटल एंड फाइनेंशियल इंडिकेटर देन विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट जीडीपी लॉस ड्यूरिंग रिसेशन and financial crisis then we'll be top sharing a shedding a bit of light on uh, unemployment rate a bit on gdp comparison then we'll talk finally about india's shift or is there a shift from a market uh, from a bank led funding to a market led funding finally conclusion and references so uh, the anglo saxon model it is also known as the market led model so uh, with the industrial revolution happening uh, the economic model that was developed was the mercantilism Uh, so there was a nexus developed between the government and the merchants and they were getting much more wealthier so because of which there was much criticism at that point of time from their economical thinkers uh, and uh, that leads to fall of uh, that model and a new model was developed and it was uh, the anglo saxon model also known as market led model so it was originated in england in the 18th century and it is developed with the classical uh, liberal ideas of adam smith so it is based on the idea that <laughs> economic system where the economic decisions about the investments uh, production and distribution decisions are based on the laws of uh, demand and supply and the government intention uh, government in intervention is very minimal so uh, that is that and according to a 2013 index of economic freedom the united states canada denmark the united kingdom hong kong and mauritius have a market economy and countries like australia new zealand and ireland also have a market economy so the characteristics of a market economy the first one is the private property so it promotes uh, ownership of goods and services so the owners okay so uh, the second one is the freedom of choice and third one is the motive of self interest so fourth uh, fourth one is the competition uh, so here what exactly happens that the competition the competitive pressure keeps the prices low if suppose there is a demand there is a huge demand for a product and so by the uh, law of demand the price its price increases uh, so seeing that the competitors uh, try to uh, try to produce that good and uh, that brings the price of that good lowers and uh, this is how the law of supply and demand functions and third one is the system of markets and prices and the limited government that we already covered so advantages of a market economy is that it promotes competition which leads to uh, efficiency the second one is promotes innovation because uh, there is a crunch in the um, among the firms that they wanted to reduce the uh, cost third one is that uh, as owners have uh, owners have the right to produce what they want so there is large variety of goods and services uh, that are available in the market and economic activity is encouraged and the fourth one is the freedom of individual choice is possible here basically what you want is that uh, there is a freedom of choice available with them so disadvantages is that there is a disparity between the uh, in wealth and mobility exists that is there still exists the economic disparity between the rich and the poor uh, the wealthier can become much more wealthier than the poor has the than the poorer for to become wealthy the second one is that uh, it is very profit oriented it does not take concerns about the environmental damages that it causes the third one that there is a uh, uh, there is a the social security a uh, social welfare program such as unemployment insurance social security and medicare uh, the budget for those has reduced because uh, because uh, these programs are supported through taxation and these uh, these are considered as a burdens uh, and the, the second one is poor working conditions can result so now is the bank based financial economy so in bank based system banks play leading so in bank based uh, system banks play leading role in mobilizing savings allocating capital overseeing investment decisions and providing risk management vehicles here the dominant institutions are large universal banks or a combination of commercial banks as in contrast to the market based economy it is tightly regulated by the state and the government so the major change happened in the bank based financial system was in 1870s when joint stock banks were established which were uh, both 
in, uh, in lending and underwriting activities. So the bank based financial economy uh, origined for the countries which came late into the um, industrialization process. So from the theory of timing of industrialization, Japan and Germany primarily followed this mo uh, model and uh, let's see why they had to go for the bank based economy in, and not for the market based economy. So countries which started industrialization early like US and UK, so they had uh, a developed financial market and they could generate funds from that market and the firms could generate uh, funds internally from them. But the countries such as Japan and Germany which entered late, so they had uh, double disadvantages. So the first disadvantage was that the firms that were entering late, they had a trouble in uh, generating funds and for the newly found industries or something, the, uh, um, internally f uh, generated funds was almost non-existent. So they needed huge investment in catching up with the other countries for industri industrialization. The second point was since the uh, financial market was not so developed, hence there was not much funds available in the market uh, in the market based financial system and the investors who were available uh, in those systems uh, they were more inclined to invest in safer assets such as government bonds so there was only one source of investment which could come out from the bank based economy and which could cater to the needs for example gather large sums of capital and take the risk in uh, such pioneering ventures which were considered as high risk and adequately monitor the, monitor the investment that they were putting so the advantages with bank based economy is that uh, that they can provide long term financial uh, capital for example if someone need capital for infrastructure and for 20 to 25 50 years for railways and uh, road structures so banks so they uh, so they can easily uh, get those kind of funds from banks the second is bank based economy is less volatile as compared to market based economy in a developing economy market uh, so market based financial model are not so developed so only funds can be generated to the bank based models and bank based economy are best supported by household sectors with low income inequality because if the inequality is high so people have high tendency to take risk and then they invest funds in market based economy but uh, when people are uh, more or less of middle class then they usually try to invest in the banks and in the uh, safe deposits the disadvantages here are it is difficult to channel funds to new companies in growth industries and as economy matures an increasing percentage of household savings are directed into the market segment of financial system than in the form of bank deposit also there is high involvement of state and uh, state and capital allocation can be restricted to a few established sector uh, and not to the new upcoming sectors so this uh, graph we got from the bank of international settlements so as we can see on the x axis uh, we are indicating average bank credit and the average turnover ratio okay and y axis is the uh, real gdp growth rate per capita so this graph we got for uh, from 2001 to 11 we could not plot it uh, after this so as we can see uh, till some point uh, this average increase in the average bank credit uh, helps increase in the real gdp growth per capita as uh, same goes for the average turnover ratio Okay, but after uh, uh, some point, uh, both uh, both increase in this. Uh, sorry, turnover ratio is about the uh, share market. Sorry, it is like uh, dividing the uh, total turn uh, shares traded divided by total outstanding shares. Okay, you got the formula here. And this uh, average bank credit is uh, given by bank credit divided by uh, by GDP. So the author is plotting the logarithm of these ratios and here it is the real GDP growth rate. So uh, author, the same author has uh, done the uh, analysis of the 71 downward episodes. So this downward episodes means uh, uh, like negative real GDP growth rate um, in more than one year. Okay, so there are uh, in 71 episode he has further segregated them into uh, the economy is having financial crisis and uh, the episodes in which there was no financial crisis and as we can see uh, overall the bank based economy is uh, like total gdp loss is uh, more and in the market based economy the total gdp loss is less uh, now segregating if there is no financial crisis okay then bank based economies perform better okay but the market based economies uh, uh, have uh, 
much less than uh, the bank based economy but if there is a financial crisis uh, bank based economies are uh, less robust than the market based economies financial economy uh, financial crisis in that uh, country if there is I mean, 4.3 addition of this, sir. Uh, real GDP loss during downturns and uh, recovery in addition. Uh, no, as a whole, sir. This is the average of 24 countries, sir. Uh, it is a uh, 4.33. Out of 24 countries uh, have been analyzed by the author. Okay, so there is a peak uh, GDP before the downturn. Okay, so the author is uh, calculating the difference between the peak GDP, okay, the highest GDP before the uh, crisis or recession, and the lowest one. Okay, and he will uh, average for all those countries. So the conclusion is uh, about uh, after segregating whether there is financial crisis or not financial crisis. So if there is no financial crisis, then bank-based economy perform better. They act better to this uh, situation. In there is no financial crisis but if there is financial that is a like explanation of why that uh, minus point zero nine so this is an unemployment rate during the global financial crisis so as we can see india germany japan and compare with us uk us uk canada i mean uh, there is two percentage point increase in the um, unemployment rate in the anglo-saxon models in us uk canada um, unemployment increased as compared to yeah, I mean, India, it is a big, because India is an exception, sir, because India, a lot of Indians work in US. I mean, uh, service sector, sir. Uh, so, India is working mainly in service, service sector. Also. So, this is the GDP. Okay. So, as such, uh, this is the, I mean, the list that it got during the crisis 13 to 63 uh, US billion dollars. And it recovered in 2011. So it took around three years. Okay, Canada took two years. UK takes maximum like uh, four years. Okay, India its GDP continues to increase, although there was a recession. And in Japan, it also took four years. So as such, there is no conclusion that can be drawn based upon GDP, like which economy performed better based upon GDP only. So let's look at the India's shift from bank-led funding to market-led funding, but. Is India actually ready for the shift? We, uh, the general consensus is that the bond market is not deep enough to finance the, uh, the real economy and also not deep enough to complement the banking sector when it comes to lending to the organized corporate sector. We are only focusing on that and also we are focusing only on the bond market. The situation is that uh, there is unprecedented rise in bad loans from the banks. The, the, now the lenders are focusing on res resolving these bad loan issues rather than looking for uh, new, uh, new candidates for lending. Also the capital market contribution is not enough for corporate funding. The, another disturbing pattern is that they are using uh, short term debt instruments more and more as against long term uh, debt instruments. Also there uh, when they issue the bonds they are uh, using the private placement route which means it is a non-public offering. The offering is being only done to a select group of uh, you know individuals or parties not to the public at large. Okay so overall there is a long way to go before capital markets can supplement bank credit and share its risk. Okay. The, uh, the Reserve Bank of India and also their financial stability review, they felt that there is a risk of concentration since the banks have very high exposure to um, large conglomerates because that's where, that's where all, the all the funding is coming from. Now in 2016, 16% of all loans were from the top 100 borrowers and from that segment itself, 22% of the bad loans came. Now, it is felt that the capital markets can share this risk, which is currently being borne mostly by the banking sector. And also some companies have been able to get uh, funds at a cheaper rate than, you know, borrowing from banks. Now, the way ahead is that since 2014, fundraising from bonds has increased steadily. And also, you know, see, trillions of money, uh, tr trillions of rupees have been borrowed and also this has increased 15% with respect to what it was in 2015. Now bank credit growth has decreased. 
to only to 8.8 percent in 2016. Now, uh, before I show you the graph, the prevailing problems today in the corporate bond market are that the secondary bond markets in India are illiquid because there is a tendency that the investors tend to hold on to the securities till their maturity. And if that is going on, then the bond holders will also not get adequate uh, adequate valuation for their holdings because they're not willing to sell it off. So this is a vicious cycle. We have seen that now this is a ratio of the bond issuances to the incremental bank credit deployment. So basically if it is 4.12 then in that year for the for the services sector only excluding BFSI the bond issuances were in uh, rupee terms were 4.12 times than the bank credit that they took. But for the industry overall, it is still less than one. You can see services uh, are an exception that they are, uh, you know, borrowing a lot of money from the bond uh, by issue of bonds. So I'll give hand you back over to Ganesh to give us the conclusions. It's widely accepted that both the banks and markets are very important for the economic growth. We cannot lean to any one side. Uh, we also find like, uh, I mean, for the less developed countries like India in the earlier stages. Banks are very much important, okay, because people are having the less credits, they need to be financed. Uh, and in the graph that I have seen, uh, like after uh, some point, uh, either they do uh, in the bank credit or turnover ratio, it does not lead to increase in the real GDP growth rate. And uh, they perform, I mean, banks and market led economies perform differently to the financial crisis. Last is uh, the stock absorbing uh, capacity. Uh, I mean, banks, uh, bank led economies is impaired during the financial crisis. Before that, we will just discuss one small thing. Uh, I have shared with you one article on economics of Bahuka and Greenspan. Have you read that? So, see, a lot of material is shared with you. I hope from exam viewpoint, you are reading the book. The material is also categorized. One folder is called A. A means it's an important folder. There are some three, four articles only. And others are additional. Additional may both sare articles only. If you have interest, you may read and it's an additional material. So of that A, one of the article is economics of Bahuka versus and Greenspan. So you know who is Greenspan? I think we have discussed. Who was he? So, Fed chief from 87 to 2007, just before the crisis. So, what could, what are the highlights of his economic policies? So, his emphasis was providing lot of credit on one hand to industries, other hand also to the government. So, idea was you push more money into the system and people will spend more and that will take up the GDP. So, there is one interesting article by uh, Professor Gurumurthy, which is one I am referring to, that are these policies new? So, not necessarily. So, he has referred to a very interesting story from Mahabharat, which exactly talks about the same phenomena. So, you do you know, do you know Kausa, who is Mama of Sri Krishna? And he was known to be a notorious king. So, people were not happy with his with him, at least they were not respecting him. So, the story goes that Kamsa was highly unpopular with his subjects. Now, he wants to improve his popularity. So, he asks his mantris as to what can be done. One of his mantris or advisors is Bauka. He tried different things, Vagera, that we will not tell the whole story. But other mantris could not give a good advice. So, ultimately one person called Bahuka, he started giving economic advice ki popularity badana hai king ka, to kya karna chahiye? To council says that I am offering, uh, I am doing many things for people, but he was using lot of uh, immoral, he was also doing lot of immoral things, which people were not happy and that's why people were not respecting council. Uska ye problem tha ki mere ko respect badana hai. Now, uh, he says that whatever I do, for some time people are happy and then there are a few people who have high respect in the society. 
kind of sadhus or rushis and then they tell everybody that kamsa is immoral and my popularity again goes down so what should i do first thing then some of the mantris tell him that okay you go and bribe these rushis or sadhus that's a obvious thing any material person will feel if they have a problem you give them lot of money make them happy so that they will start praising kamsa if they themselves praise then general public will also praise then bahu ka tell don't do that because these people are sadhus they are not for material gains even if you pay them first they will refuse on the contrary they will tell more bad things about you that he is trying to bribe us so they can't be won by money so that is gone second counsel says that okay i'll put them all in prison unko band kar dete hai unke upar kuch punitive action lete hai because they are doing something against the king bauka says don't do that also because that will send a very wrong message to the people people are as it is unhappy they would be 10 times more unhappy if you put all these sadhus and rushis in bar they would be absolutely against your rule the last thing he so last means they which is our advices by others now bahuka tells that you give lot of money to people then let them enjoy liquor and all other things and once they become habituated to all these things they will not go to sadhus rather sadhus will tell them that don't go for consumerism and these people are now interested in all these things then they will start disrespecting the sadhus and that is a time they would start respecting kausa so he has compared that economic policies of bahuka were exactly what is like green spam followed in 1986 so our chapter is chapter 5 types of business models now um, before starting with what is business model and why do we need it business model actually provides a set of generic level descriptions which ca uh, can create and distribute value in profitable manner and also it identifies the customer base products and details of financing in this chapter we will be talking about basically uh, dividing the business model into western business model and eastern business model so uh, coming to western business models as we see that um, generally in the capitalist economy they the entrepreneurs actually have the uh, freedom to choose models and their competition plays an important role but when we talk about capitalist economy we actually see that uh, on one hand there's uh, us and other on the other hand there's uh, Jap japanese economy the uh, us economy is more of the um, aggressive economy where they actually try to uh, de deal with the things in aggressive manner and aggressive business manners dominate whereas in case of uh, japanese economy we see that uh, this aggressive business manners cannot dominate to a large extent and they try to more follow a uh, family like structure where uh, you have some uh, autonomy to perform but uh, there is something which uh, the family like structure which has been followed so uh, as we can see that the capitalist economy uh, though both ja japanese economy and uh, us economy are capitalist economy but still there is a difference between uh, how they uh, perform and the uh, the difference between the business models they perform with uh, so we can see because of this uh, capitalist also is not a uniform throughout coming to uh, eastern business models so uh, just now as i spoke about the western business models and we saw that even uh, leave the japan which is uh, but if we see the us and eu so even the uh, e the us and eu both in uh, uh, though japan belong to different continent but uh, even within the eu there are different uh, countries which follow different business models so th that we can say that uh, even the countries which is belonging to same geographical location there would be difference in uh, the business models that they would be following because of their different cultures or uh, other different factors so the economic system is not the only factor that uh, decides the business model now uh, coming to eastern business models we can see that there are lot of factors which actually uh, influence like cultural differences there can be different uh, culture with between different countries as well as within the countries there would be a position of families which decide uh, the business model and on uh, the actual and nominal power holders like uh, we will take the example of uh, japanese and chinese economic model so uh, we can say that uh, in case of japanese economic model the uh, economic model is a uh, country like uh, sorry family like where um, the real holder of power is an anonymous person behind the scenes so here it's a family like and not literally families because uh, 
do uh, there is a, a authority structure and sense of moral obligations but still uh, it is with voluntarism uh, unconstrained by kingship whereas in case of chinese model we can say that the nominal holder is actually the holder and their business model is totally like uh, literal it's literally families now uh, they were yes should explain further uh, difference between these yeah so uh, these are the three business organizations in japan korea and taiwan so as we can see uh, in eastern models uh, eastern models also there's a difference in countries itself so uh, in the personal authority uh, the japan organizations have low priority as compared to korea and taiwan in so japan business uh, models promote uh, group morals and group activities rather than uh, self assertiveness and that's found less in uh, korea and taiwan so i'm giving an example of facebook so the average uh, so we consider the business model of facebook here so the average revenue per, per user in uh, in the western models western business model of facebook and in the asia pacific model so there's a great difference here so that is because um, the western model yeah so the uh, western the western models are more free with advertising business model and the eastern models are transaction based models so also china doesn't have facebook so that also impacts its revenue here the thing is in uh, in the western business models they are more uh, advertisement based models free with advertisement based models and the eastern uh, business models are transaction based models so this is the average revenue per, per user due to advertisement so basically we are showing that yeah per user the revenue generated per user this is 2015 yeah but like in uh, in asia pacific it's quite low it's like nine times so this is the uh, gdp per capita data uh, and uh, versus cumulative share of global population so uh, we could see that the free advertising business models would work are working in better in the right off of this part so we can follow this up with uh, that these these countries have a mature and a saturated internet population so advertising there would be more productive than advertising here and these countries with low uh, low gdp are better for transaction based purposes so those business model would be more effective here so what is transaction based so anywhere which uh, where you could have a transaction they uh, so indians you could consider indians we won't pay for uh, facebook advertisement as much if you are paying for say amazon you are buying something or there is a transaction happening but facebook also there is a transaction happening but it is advertisement made suppose you are boosting a page or any seo service any sem service so you have to pay for it you would pay less here so universality of models uh, so by this you can't have a uniform universal business model due to differences in business models in west and east and also within them also countries with same ideologies have different models as in us and france they both have capitalist ideologies but difference in cultures and purchasing power uh, they have different business models uh, global firms like mcdonald's coca cola also don't follow a global model because it's not possible as in in asia they have spicier foods in russia they have a different uh, section of foods in india more people are vegetarian and don't eat beef in other areas they eat beef so they can't have a same policy everywhere uh, a stable family strong communities and mutual trust also affect models as in korean families are korean communities are well knit and that affects their business hierarchy also uh, rather than african american uh, uh, communities which are virtually non existent in uh, closeness also religious beliefs and teachings affect a business model as in uh, sharia uh, compliant is, uh, islamic hedge fund was founded by permal in 2013 so 
also islamic bonds are introduced in the malaysian financial market and they are growing at a rate of 31% the issuance of bonds is growing at a rate of 31% as compared to the issuance of bonds overall which is 10% so we can see that islamic uh, religious beliefs also affect so i conclude by saying that other than economic systems cultural social and community system play important role in making of business models uh, countries with diverse backgrounds have different business models as in india you can see that in tamil nadu uh, sankagiri uh, is a place and tiruchinagode so they both have different they are just 20 kilometers apart and they have different business models and different priorities so that is because of uh, different cultural aspects there this chapter 5 is very small but we have already discussed but it is being reinforced that you can't have a universalization of the model different geographies and different cultures and different societies need different model which is now getting accepted post say 2005 or something 90s etc there was a belief that there is only one successful model now it is being accepted that you need to study understand different models our whole course is also one of the efforts to understand indian model so in theme of the uh, in theme of this course chapter 6 uh, deals with ancient business models and uh, it uh, shows what kind of economic forms and structures were available in ancient india uh, now it uh, highlights some of the important uh, forms of economy uh, during mohenjodaro uh, during mauryan empire some of the uh, forms which were emerged in buddhist empire so all these forms of uh, economy have added to what we can today refer to as indian business model so these form the basis of uh, uh, these uh, these were emerged from the social structures which were available at that time and uh, economic models and social structures uh, kind of went hand in hand so the, in uh, ancient india possessed the corporate form which was called the shreni by at least 800 bc this so this predates any form of corporate that was uh, that was uh, attributed to roman empire uh, but this is predating it by uh, some thousand years so you can see that indian uh, form of uh, corporates were uh, um, uh, evolved much earlier compared to our western counterparts the shreni possessed uh, detailed rules of uh, corporate government uh, that share many similarities with the us companies that are uh, that are today so uh, precursor uh, to <laughs> and uh, very closely related there were different kinds of corporate forms there was gana pani puga samgha and nigama or uh, like pani was a uh, pa type of partnership company where uh, you had rules regarding partnership and shared business model so whatever uh, returns you got from the business they were uh, shared among the partners the economic shreni uh, shreni was uh, one of the most important uh, aspects of this ancient business model and shreni was a separate legal entity at that time and there were contracts written in shreni and any disputes in this contract were settled uh, in bhandagarika and uh, used in uh, shreni were used in variety uh, were involved in variety of trade activities right from artisans craftsmen Uh, and it was also integrated very uh, nicely with the social structure of that uh, time so uh, initially there were some references to papers in which there were shrinis uh, which were belonging to single caste in uh, some of the cases where they, uh, there was a requirement of multiple skills shrinis were involving people from different caste so uh, the economic uh, shrini structure was three tiered there was a head uh, headman Uh, which was called jethaka or shreshti then there were executive officers and there were members so uh, and there was a uh, open consensus between these people so all these uh, rules were, were similar to what uh, corporate governance is to the, for today's company basic features are very similar it had a legal personality uh, it had a transferability then uh, internal rules uh, Uh, were called shreni dharma and everybody abided by this dharma so there was a strong value system which was underlying this shreni uh, economic shrinis so member powers and formation uh, so there was a proper structure to what powers were attributed to each of the members and what say they had 
like voting rights uh, and regulations and there was transparency in the entire structure. So the, these were the um, key highlights of Shreni. So now if we see the development of corporate forms in ancient India. So starting from long back in earliest civilization, in Mehergarh and others during 7500 BC to 4500 BC. Also they were very advanced civilization but, but there was not much proofs of existing of corporate, corporate forms like Shreni. But uh, after, the, uh, after that Indus era, it was also very highly developed and very little evidence of Shreni or the other corporate forms. After that, uh, in 1900 to 800 BC, there is a strong ev evidence of uh, Shreni and also the environment was very conducive to business. So business was flourishing in that era. And after that, during 800 to 400 BC, in, in that era, uh, Buddhism and Jainism was on peak and also those religions were very favorable to business. And uh, so, uh, in that era, Shreni was a uh, highly developed and also there was a development of Bandhakarika that is a uh, inter, inter Shreni, it is an arbitration committee for inter Shreni disputes. And after that, uh, in modern Dashni, uh, India was more uh, unified during 300 to 8, 320 BC to 185 BC. And also, like uh, surrounding circumstances are very uh, uh, favorable to business. There was uh, accounting practices proper uh, democratization and also uh, the role of Buddhism and uh, Arthasas was very po uh, positive in the uh, in flourishing of business. After that uh, post modern uh, there was a divides in India empires uh, but uh, still uh, trade, was, trade was growing and also the uh, there was a discovery by wish on of monsoon which they can use the, use the winds to uh, do the uh, business by sea routes. So business was flourishing outside of India as well and also during that era there is a lot of evidence of uh, Shreni and uh, its uh, uh, follow, follow up is Dharma. And after that in Gupta dynasty uh, during uh, 250 to 550 AD it is called also called as the golden era of India in that uh, business was flourishing in all the direction in outside India inside India and uh, also there is a uh, very uh, clearly developed accounting principles. Also localized professional and the uh, uh, Shreni was uh, followed very religiously. After that post Gupta, Gupta the trade declined also uh, there was a lot of warfare, Islamic invasion due to which the business decades and also the trade routes was not very safe. So business continued to decline also due to which the significance of Shreni, uh, Shreni also declines. After that during period of 1200 to 1500 AD the economic activities was flourishing but the uh, decentralization of uh, uh, business uh, models like uh, ancient self governance village assembly was uh, decaying. So, due to which uh, uh, it was more on centralized on the capital area, and also there is a less significance of Shreni in that, that reason. When East India Company established in 1600, uh, Asia was dominating world trade uh, led by India. So, in 1618, uh, British uh, in East India Company. Uh, made first trade agreement uh, with Mughal Empire with whom uh, with whose it got uh, ability to export its good. In 1650 it, it won the ability to export good from Bengal that Hubli port and it is duty free at annual payment of rupees uh, 3000. Uh, during 1886 and 1689 uh, the Anglo-Mughal wars was begun and uh, in 1717 17, company one imperial backing through famous Farman of Imperial Parukshire and it exempted it from uh, duty, uh, exempted British uh, shipments from uh, duty. In 1757, the ba Battle of Plassey took place and in that British won the Bengal uh, uh, area and uh, due to the, uh, this, 1757 and 1780, 38.40 uh, million pounds of outflow uh, took place from India to uh, Western. India to uh, British. So, 1857 was the first war of independence. After that, in 1858, uh, India Act was uh, uh, India Act was came into power uh, from Brit British uh, rulers. Uh, so, the limits on growth of business because of the ma uh, many uh, private ba banks, only one bank was in Indian hands, and so that uh, raising capital for business was very difficult for Indian businesses. Uh, looking at the differentiation, uh, Indian have only uh, presence in cotton textile business 
and british on the other hand have jute textile coal mining steam shipping inland navigation tea and coffee plantation business in their hand final decade of 19th century was the major turnover for india and the swadeshi economy uh, moment was uh, to place in that uh, decade and uh, new ventures in initial decades of 20th century uh, that was majorly started in uh, bengal so in 1907 uh, tata iron and steel was registered and all the capital for that was raised by uh, raised in india itself uh, post world war 1 many new enterprises came but all of them were uh, at the smaller uh, range so in 1939 the only 19 of 57 largest groups were indian that shows that english companies were dominating the businesses in most of the sectors so now moving on to the business in independent india so uh, during the the time of independence uh, india was majorly an agricultural economy uh, the agriculture contribution to gdp like it has declined from 1951 till date shown in the graph uh, while the services uh, sector has increased Uh, the contribution from sector service sector has increased uh, plus the agriculture and allied sector like uh, uh, forestry logging uh, fishing accounted for 70, 17 17% of the gdp and employed uh, 49% of the total workforce in 2014 that's the data and uh, the food grain production has uh, increased the graph from economic survey okay uh, now the, pro- the point of the uh, industry the industry the major uh, like the changes which uh, we have seen is the license permit raj now what it has done is that it created difficulties for growth of uh, industries and business uh, pr- but uh, it also said that there was a new new group of people who were coming in business and uh, it kind of uh, uh, like uh, kind of decreased the uh, socio economic barrier and uh, plus the new policies with the government uh, like um, the new policies with the government was put uh, created a division of industrial sector into public and private the public uh, industry uh, they they started growing and they displaced started displacing the british uh, the expatriates who were commanding position till 1947 um, indian industry which uh, grew has a at a steadfast private industry, a, a private industry. Yeah. the indian industry which grew uh, steadfast uh, the major reasons were uh, mostly because of the focus of the government on industrialization uh, plus by introducing supporting policies plus the strong family and communal communal ties uh, which aided in the funding uh the entrepreneur mindset and the high skill set of indians uh, like they help in shift understanding of the business uh, plus the availability of land abundance of natural resources and cheap labor uh, gave a good push uh, so some of the prominent belts of production are like uh, tirupur in tamil nadu for textile uh, gujarat uh, surat gujarat for textile hub and chandigarh padra for manufacturing hub this have been created moving on to the next part of our presentation which is about the knowledge industry in which the india is growing steadfastly when compared to the other sectors there are two primary reasons because of which the growth of knowledge industries have become very prominent for india and those two were historical coincidence and the structural and systemic factors when it comes to historical coincidence the time at which the indian economy started growing towards knowledge industry is during y2k and the dot com boom so that gave a significant push for the people to move towards the computer and the technology part and the other one is a systemic support from the government so most of the government initiatives and the government uh, enterprises started supporting the move of technology and uh, that aided the push and some of the notable interventions from the government are uh, scpes uh, and uh, stpi nmi tli process so that helped the people to move more towards the uh, knowledge industries and the next part and uh, there are various other reasons which have also led to the growth of the knowledge industry some of them is the uh, the emphasis on the higher education part both from the government and also from the family when the literacy rate of the india was lagging and uh, suddenly the knowledge industry started going the most of the people started pushing the kids and also the government started uh, pushing for the more uplore of the universities and the technical institutions so as to increase the growth of the knowledge industries and uh, during the there is a significant statistic in which the funding for the iits and iises is have uh, tripled in the quantum of 10 years during between 1993 to 2003 and 4 so that is how the government have started pushing for the uh, knowledge industries and that helped the people to move towards uh, them and the various private technical universities started growing because in the olden days there is only pu- pu- public institutions i mean the central government institutes and the state government institutes then the more of the private institutions also came into play to enable the skill development for the most number of people in the country and uh, this is a global uh, service location index that has been compared with uh, india and other companies and that has been done by atkirni 
and India stood first during the time of 2005, where we were steadily growing in the software and then the other areas of the knowledge industry. Yes, sir. Okay. Cumulative. Yes, sir. Uh, mainly on the financial structure and on the people skills and availability, and uh, on the business environment for uh, the growth. This is done by ATK. These are the three indexes. They have come. Yes, sir. They. This is a consulting firm which conducts for their uh, business development program and they consider these three index are primary for the growth of knowledge industry and they have uh, rated these three and compared it with the other countries. Sir, uh, yes, sir, Singapore, Singapore for 1.62. And uh, and also the growth of the knowledge industries have significantly moved from the creation of the human capital because uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru during the time of the thing they mentioned that uh, to provide scientists and technologists of the highest caliber who would engage in research, design and development to help build them for the nations towards self-reliance. And uh, during 2003, it has been shifted to creation of knowledge and intellectual capital. So to be the found, and that has been told by the IIT Bombay's vision statement. So to be the fountain head of new ideas and innovators in technology and science. And currently it is about the creation of the wealth by supporting the patents, IPRs and various other which we will be able to uh, earn more and can create wealth using our high skills and uh, uh, plenty of human resources that, uh, that are available in India. These are some of the closing codes that has been uh, mentioned in the New Scientist and the Newsweek. So India is the next knowledge power and India the future factories. Future factories is about the growing uh, uh, presence of the Indian economy in the knowledge part where other countries are investing in India in the larger number. Uh, so we are uh, presenting on the topic uh, called India as an emerging, emerging uh, economic power. So through this presentation we will be going through about how India has grown to be one of the major players in the today's world economy and how it is influencing the entire global uh, economics. So first of all, we'll start with some of the opinions that uh, many uh, leaders have given about India and its development in the global economic context. So uh, some fact as we can see is in terms of GDP that is measured by purchasing power parity which we've already discussed in class in the previous uh, sessions that India is now the third largest GDP with 7.9 trillion dollars of uh, GDP just behind China and USA. In terms of IT sector, India has uh, is growing at a rate of is expected to grow at a rate of 12 to 14 percent in the financial year 2016 to 17, and the annual revenue is almost 350 US billion dollars. And if you can see the uh, division of uh, software industry, uh, uh, the the light blue color shows about how much we gain from our exports, how much uh, revenue we gain from our exports in the uh, exports in the software industry, and how much is the domestic revenue. So you can see major chunk is actually exported to outside which actually uh, which uh, uh, aligns with the fact that many of the Indian IT professionals actually mo move on to foreign countries and uh, have been uh, con contributing to the development in those nations also. Uh, and, uh, many uh, behemoths in the uh, corporate sector like GE, Microsoft have established the research and development centers in India which uh, again sh goes on to show that uh, even the multinational companies consider India as one of the uh, major uh, uh, countries that is uh, that has a major say in the technological development in, in today's world. Now, as uh, some of the uh, major opinions that have been given, uh, Mr. H. Reiter, the former G uh, German uh, ambassador to India, he mentioned that the R&D development work carried out in India is of world-class standards, and it is now attracting many German biotech companies who are now keen on setting up JVs and R&D facilities uh, in India. Uh, and the former uh, uh, US ambassador to India also said that America can no longer ignore the fact that uh, the center of gravity is now moving towards Asia and India will be the motor force in the globalization of today's economy. Uh, now these are some of the uh, some glimpses on India's recent performances in the in the economic sector. So if you can see uh, the first point shows that it is uh, uh, which have already been discussed in the class previously also that India was one of the countries which was very least affected by the global economic crisis because of uh, very strong economic policies uh, that were taken up by the Indian government and the RBI at that point of time. Uh, today India's economic growth rate is at almost 7.9 percent whereas the world growth rate is only 2.6 percent which shows how much uh, development India is showing compared to the overall world average. Uh, the FDI inflows uh, in India were, uh, 
uh, is 44 billion dollars that is a whopping amount it shows that the amount of importance that uh, other industries and foreign investors are giving to india as a nation uh, india is also the large yes sir, 15 yes sir this is 15 because 16 data has not been released all these sources are world bank data so i 16 is not available in the world bank uh, and uh, India is also the largest recipient of foreign remittances in 2015. Again, that shows that how much uh, importance that uh, people from outside of India are giving to India as, an, as a nation uh, uh, that contributes to the world development. Uh, in terms of gold consumption, India has been maintaining the top spot amongst all countries for a very, very long period of time. Oh, I con con confused you to the previous one, sorry, and that's my mistake. Uh, so, um, as I was talking of the global gold consumption, India has been continuously maintaining the top spot among all the countries uh, for global gold consumption and it is continuing to do so as well. Uh, and uh, the last, we'll move on to the last point which shows that India has actually now replaced China as the most preferred location for FDI as we were discussing now. That it is now the most preferred location for FDI uh, attracting projects worth 63 billion dollars. Okay, so cross-border acquisitions by companies. So increasing number of Indian companies are now in the acquisition spree especially of overseas companies in the last few years. So the main reason being the international expansion of operations, inorganic growth, reach the global markets and access the world class technology. So when we come to outbound cross-border mergers and acquisitions, we see that world in the world it has been increasing drastically. But in India it had fall it had fallen in 2014, in 2013-14 and since then it has increased very high, nearly doubling each year. So we can see that currently the uh, it has 9.7 billion dollars as compared to China which is 140 billion dollars. So this is outgoing. So basically companies like Tata Steel and companies like Bharti Airtel going outside and capturing the markets in the outside world. So a few recent takeovers being the Bharti Airtel's takeover of African assets of uh, Kuwait Zain for 10.7 billion dollars, Tata's, Tata's acquisition of Chorus, Mittal Steel's acquisition of Luxembourg based uh, 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 Arcelor SA, then uh, Sundaram Fasteners taking up uh, t uh, of the flagship company of TVS Group basically. So they have taken companies in UK, China and Germany recently and Ranbaxi Laboratories have uh, affiliates all along like 46 countries and 7 re uh, in re so resulting pressure. So this shows that we have been cr con considerably growing for the past 2 years in the terms of outbound uh, acquisitions now. We are trying to expand into other countries and capture the, those markets. Even Tata Steel, Tata Motors currently has uh, started moving to Europe with uh, getting affiliated with uh, uh, the footballer uh, uh, Messi. So these are the things that they are trying to do, capture the market outside also. It's, 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 yeah, it's a UK based. It's now, it's now owned by So uh, we see that India has emerged as the dominant supplier of talents across India, uh, sorry, across the world. So uh, we see that India has the uh, maximum number of graduates and engineers passing out every year as compared to other countries in the world. Also, uh, Indians are taking up uh, different uh, significant positions in different, uh, posi uh, in different organization across the world uh, in all the fields like medicines, engineering, uh, information technology and education. We also see that uh, the number of people who know English in India has uh, crossed the population of England. And also, uh, educational institution of our country, such as IIT and IIMs, have have got a lot of respect across the world. So we have a, a very well-known magazine known as Time has noted that uh, CEOs are India's leading exports. So yeah, so talking about the Indian economy, the one of the advantages that we have is our population. So the majority of our population lies in the working age. So this chart shows the total population uh, of the developed and developing countries, which percentage of population which lies in the uh, population age 60 or above. So as we can see in developing countries it is pretty less. This is the 2015 and the 2030 projected data given by given in the UN uh, in the UN data it is there. And uh, talking about the population working population age as compared to UK and India we are comparing 2015 and the projected 2050. So the uh, difference difference between the uh, working age population is increasing between UK and India. So, yeah, percentage that is increasing. So that is basically the demogra demographic dividend that we talk about because the working age population is higher and this is the median age population for all the major countries. Again, we can see that uh, India is India would be one of the uh, youngest countries in the world among the youngest countries in the world uh, in the future years.
and that is a major advantage for India to grow as an economy. And the other factor is the high expected growth rates that is uh, given. So, this is the again projected data for the GDP growth 2016 and 2050 India would be uh, at the number 3 position and is currently at number 3 position and is uh, preparing to re reach at number 2 position in 2050 and uh, this is the GDP comparison for all of these five, uh, four, uh, 5 countries current GDP and this is the annual growth rate for uh, GDP. So, as we can see uh, the growth rate for India is among the highest is the highest uh, for 2016 to 20 and for all the years for all the decades that we are seeing. So, the projected growth rate for India is the highest for uh, GDP. So, in the end to talk about the unrealized potential and uh, unrecognized talent in India, uh, we have a we have a large population as was shown in the previous slides and uh, much of it is untapped talent and uh, some of the key strengths of any country are its social uh, capital and its traditional knowledge systems. India uh, comes from uh, a rich tradition of uh, communicating and delivering knowledge uh, orally over the over our long history and uh, it has evolved through its interaction uh, with other cultures at a local level uh, and these have resulted in very strong local cultures, uh, cultural, uh, culture specific local knowledge uh, and uh, again in the textbook is said that uh, most of the countries when they are in a, a rich stage of uh, growth, they use these uh, knowledge systems uh, to their benefit to uh, improve their growth. Um, and we will take a specific example of agriculture. Uh, in agriculture, India's cultivable land is uh, the highest proportion uh, in all of all of the world. India's three fifths of India's land is cultivable, and uh, this, in terms of numbers uh, in million hectares, is shown. And India has a considerable uh, land which is used in very different ways uh, with ex uh, with extraordinary fertility, which is in a relatively compact and smaller land mass which is the uh, strength of our country and uh, we have more fertile lands than anywhere else in the world and our average product still our average production per unit land is about one third that of developed nations so there is a long uh, strong scope for us to build uh, and improve in this sector so that is what speaks a lot about the unrealized potential and where we have to head this is there in the textbooks but this value and there are some other values that are researched on like 50% of our land is dependent on irrigation uh, through rainwater and there are many more facts which help. So basically now we try to understand that what the reason behind uh, we should understand the Indian model and uh, how they are different from the western model. So if we see the, uh, the Indian model quite superior to the western model and the economic and the management that is there in the Indian sector Indian uh, is quite different and it is not a textbook model that we see in the western world and it is quite functional. Therefore, is the reason that if we use popular theories that uh, we have in the current system, it would we would not be able to understand it because in India uh, all the uh, models are inherited with culture and as well as social, they are quite linked to it. So, one needs to go, go deep in and understand the social part and the cultural part of the of the uh, India to understand the Indian model. Like there is another perspective that we cannot have our own model <coughs> within the Indian itself. The basic reason is that uh, first of all, uh, they do not have understanding of the Indian model. Secondly, uh, they think that India is quite traditional and anti-modern. So like one of the perspectives that we see is uh, that wherever the banking sector is not there, we would not be having any investments and there would be no uh, growth in that sector, in that area. But what we have seen in Surat is quite uh, drastically different. Uh, the, we have a diamond industry of which I have a turnover around 70,000 crore and their FDI is almost negligible, but still it is growing at a very fast rate. Then secondly, uh, what we see is that to have a, a innovation that is very important for a success and uh, for a, a company to grow in, in Indian, I would say that one has to be 
uh, cheap and could uh, reach the largest scale of the people. So, like what we see in India is like uh, no one has able to copy that. Like a cent for a minute and only a two thousand dollar for a car. So these are some in innovation products that India is being doing and which other countries are not able to copy because of the Indian model. Again, uh, we, if we see that these models are generally we can call as Gandhian innovation because affordability and sustainability was the key thing that was said by Mr. Uh, Gandhi. Uh, and also one of the be best thing is that the uh, innovation is not happening in a particular sector. It is happening all around in different sectors like wind energy, power, then uh, drug development, automobile sector, each, each and every sector. So as uh, Ambud just pointed out that the Indian economy model is very uh, unique in its own way. Uh, it does not follow the textbook traditions that the western world does. So a few illust illustrations of how uh, this Indian economic model has uh, turned out to be very successful. So the, f the first example we are going to talk about is are the Dabbawalas in Mumbai. So uh, who are the Dabbawalas? So they are basically semi-literate people with uh, rural backgrounds from the Pune region. Uh, they, be they basically belong to the warrior caste of Malwa and fought for Shivaji in the earlier days. Uh, a, p a gentleman called Mahado, he started the supply of uh, lunch boxes in 1890, more than 120 years ago. And today they are all working under the name of Nutan Mumbai Tiffin Box Suppliers. They consist of a network of more than 4,500 supplying more than 2 lakh boxes every day. Uh, with less than one mistake per 8 million deliveries, uh, Forbes Global Magazine actually gave them Six Sigma efficiency rating. And they are actually doing much better than the Six Sigma efficiency. Uh, they are rated on par with MNCs like Motorola, General Electric etc. And have been an inspiration to all organizations who are uh, aspiring to achieve such efficiency. Now how have they been able to do that? While other organizations around the world, they hire the so-called management experts. Uh, these people have basically relied on effective teamwork, efficient planning and application of logical reasoning basically. And that is how they have been able to achieve the success that they have. The next example is of Amul India, uh, one of the biggest cooperative enterprises in the world. And this model again is very different from similar dairy cooperatives around the world. Uh, over here in India, each family owns only one or two cows. Uh, and the milking process is also manual rather than automa automatic as in the western countries. Uh, the, uh, the milk produced from all these different families are collected uh, and sent to a centralized processing center. And there are wide distribution units and they are integrated with the processing and the marketing systems to ensure proper distribution to each and every part of the country. Uh, another uh, very peculiar example of a community economic model in India uh, comes from uh, a small town called uh, Palamedu, which is 25 kilometers from Madurai. Uh, it only has a population of around 8,000 uh, odd. Uh, majority community of the uh, village is uh, basically the Nadars, who started a dairy farm in the 1960s. Uh, through the success that they achieved there, they started promoting the community-owned uh, community owned activities such as owning their own grocery stores, salons, cinemas and, other, and even toilets. And what happened is that looking at this, the other communities in the uh, same village and in the uh, surrounding areas, they also joined hands and they also started another dairy uh, another dairy cooperative which again is very successful. So basically what we are trying to say is that there is a very cordial, cordial relationship which exists between the members of all these communities uh, and they are highly disciplined. There is, no, there is no liquor which is allowed to be consumed inside the premises of that village. Uh, there are no divorces as such and everything is handled within and very peacefully. Uh, an example of a very peculiar business model in the financial institution is the Tamil Nadu Mercantile Bank. Uh, so, the general assumption was that FIs can only be uh, managed successfully by highly qualified people and banks were basically something which were promoted by trading communities only. Now, this is a clear cut example of how India deviated from this general thinking. Uh, it is a highly successful bank which is promoted by non-trading communities in South. With a capital investment of only 28 lakhs, they have been able to have reserves of in excess of 1000 crores, deposits in excess of 11,000 crores and a net profit in excess of 250 crores. Uh, earnings per share of 6487 is very very respectable and the business per employee is, only a, is, is, is as high as 8.7 crores. So this gives an indication of how well they have managed their business. Dividends of 5000% and 9000% have act in 2007-2011 respectively have actually put them in the Guinness Book of World Record. Similar examples include uh, Karur Vaishya Bank and Lakshmi Vilas Bank which are basically community led banks. Just look at the uh, head office of this particular bank and there is from, from no angle can you say that this is not a modern uh, facility as such. So the basic question comes, can India surpass China? 
uh, this is the basic race which is being played all around, which has gained uh, particular significance in the recent past. Uh, China's faster growth rate generally uh, is due to its ability to get uh, more uh, foreign investments. So as you can see, the FDI inflows in China and India are listed over here over the years. So while India stays low, but the rate of growth of FDI in India is much higher than in China. Now during 1990s, the FDI's as a percentage of the GDP was 3.6% for China versus only 0.5% for India. Now this is because India's economic growth is not FDI dependent as is the case with China. And that is why it has a much better and sustainable economic model uh, and it has a very long term advantage. Uh, statistics show that these, these statistics which we see of the overall economy, they show one part of the macroeconomic story. But at the micro level, things are very different. The best part about the Indian model is that the primary reliance on organic growth, they enable fuller usage of the resources. So that is why India in the long term are in a much better hand. So basic difference between India and China's uh, model is that China, whereas they, uh, China follows a top down approach, India basically follows a ground up approach. And uh, since China's Communist Party came into power in 1949, they had the intent to eradicate all this private uh, ownership. But uh, if, uh, three decades ago, they went for the free market reforms. And now in the third decade, they are, str they are seriously struggling. And, and very uh, easy evidence of that can be seen through the fact that now capitalists are actually officially allowed to join the, com uh, the Communist Party of China. So uh, on the other hand, what has India done? India has not completely gone to communist side, but they have developed a uh, softer brand of socialism. Aim was not to demoralize the entrepreneurs or remove the uh, capitalism as such, but only look at what are the long-term benefits and focus on them and removing all the, uh, all the disadvantages of uh, capitalism as such. These are, these are some of the forecasts in terms of how India and China are forecasted to uh, be at in the year 2030. And what we can see is that India is going to uh, outperform China in most of these areas. Thank you, Mridul. So, actually, what we are seeing that after a long time, India is now gradually crossing the China's GDP, and it has mainly been due to the focus on the domestic consumption. So, after what in, during 1990s, uh, India tried to privatize its economy. Although privatization has been at a slower pace, but it has been gradually taking place. Apart from uh, it, other reason that can be attributed to it is that bureaucracy has gradually been trimmed. So. As India, as uh, Mridul and uh, Ambuj have told that Indian case is a pretty different case where India has grown sustainable entrepreneurs which have been fu uh, fueling its growth. So what really happened during 1990s that other countries were following the West prescribed export led policies and India also tried to follow that. But in, but afterwards the studies show that, uh, that while hi high self financing ratio uh, the countries which have high self-financing ratios have gradually performed much better than countries who have whose growth have been largely dependent on the FDI. So now we should not uh, um, uh, follow those uh, Western model where uh, we are uh, trying to bring more FDI. Rather, we should go for high self-financing. Apart from that, we should also stop thinking of uh, only exporting to US, or uh, and we can uh, uh, produce goods for our domestic consumption as well as for our other regional partners. So, the focus should now be that we should produce for our domestic uh, uh, consumers and it will lead to uh, creation of goods which are centra, uh, centered for our own Indian people. So what should be the focus is India could be run by the Indians. So which kind of skills exist in the country? So mainly there are three types, entrepreneurial, uh, technical and managerial. So the cluster bubbling with activities in India are developed by ordinary persons who possess these skills uh, and the plus skills which are acquired by formally qualified Indians in the knowledge sector. These skills have already made India a major industrial and service uh, center in the world. The example being Dhirubhai Ambani who was just an ordinary person who possess these skills and uh, take his company to a uh, global stage. The greatest strength of India is just not the number of people or how India adjusts them and put them into work. It is the skill level that exists at the ground and the, at the lowest level in the society. The civil society which is a complex mixture of charities, media, educational institution etc. are the primary instru instrument by which people socialize in their culture. So India's cultural background is most significant asset. The culture of India uh, compels its people to work hard, lead simple lives and uh, save money for their families. 
the high level of social capital that exist in india is more sustainable and balanced than the rest of the world and their societies so one example being japan learning from india so one com com coimbatore based textile company had business relations with japan so when the uh, employees from japan visited their company in uh, coimbatore they were so impressed that they asked to send their laborers to send uh, japan for a one in one year assignment to train their employees in japan so they were just three ordinary villages uh, village boys who went there and uh, uh, taught uh, and gave tra training to the japanese employees and they were so impressed that from next year they made it a regular uh, phenomenon and they asked for even more uh, number of trainers so india's 1 billion population is most heter <coughs> heterogeneous in the world uh, european union has uh, multiple ethnicities and religious groups but india india is even more being just one simple country in spite of a union of several countries india itself has more diverse ethnic lingual and religious group than european union uh, yet a great uh, degree of unity has been achieved uh, in the india's disparate ethnicities uh, in a global environment where everyone <coughs> is desperate for new ideas philosophy and religion uh, india is the most prolific birthplace of all three the great synergy of democracy and diversity which exist in india which has been seen uh, during several elections and etc it is a uh, remarkable so we were talking about the indian diaspora so the indian diaspora is of basically 20 million and is extremely successful in many countries so they play a crucial role in many countries to the us and the uk also they are into highly sophisticated areas such as it medicine engineering and finance uh, they are pro professionally and economically mobile and also they are recognized so the world for their high business acumen so these are the reasons that they are cr crucial to the functioning of defense sector in many countries and the prime example is the growth of the business sector in the silicon valley so these are the reasons for their success so hard work uh, absolutely necessary now thrift thrift is basically using scarce resources like money uh, that we indians use very intelligently and effectively also the stability of the families and also the adaptability to the new environment that is adjusting to the new environment uh, so lastly to the conclusion so uh, so i will be reading this out so indian emergence is not the emergence of any other country it is a reemergence of traditional power that had to low life because of historical reasons so it is a emergence of power that provides solutions to contemporary issues and show the way for sustainable development models and this i will be quoting lemon so perhaps the most encouraging development in the early 21st century is the emergence of india as an increasingly global force economically politically and culturally so that that's how we come to the end of the chapter thank you so our topic is social capital and its role in economic development caste as a social capital in india so first of all we will be talking about the social capital what its role in the economic development and what's caste as a social capital in india uh, affects the how the economic development of the country first what is social capital according to robert putnam the public policy officer at harvard business school social capital consists of features of social organization such as network norms social trust that facilitate uh, coordination and cooperation of mutual benefit social capital often uh, derives from original organization set up for, for a specific purpose the social means the network doesn't end at the particular specific purpose it enhances the network and uh, work for the betterment of both of the parties like for some specific purpose purpose can be like a member of the club and church attendance but from there you develop your network and then it enhances from over there and it work for the mutual benefit social capital focuses on the strength of our ties level of trust and levels of recipro reciprocity the mutual exchange benefits advantages of social capital networks Uh, networks reduce in incentives for opportunism a uh, network broadens party participant sense of the self and uh, networks of civic en engagement foster norms of generalized mutual benefits mutual exchange of the benefits and encourage the uh, emergence of social trust among the members of the social capital impact of social capital on economic development uh, through various studies it has been developed that social capital has the impact on the economic development of the nation one of this uh, one of the studies that was done by uh, one of the research paper published by the robert putnam in 1993 uh, which says that that countries it has been relatively higher stocks of social capital in terms of general trust and widespread civic engagement seem to achieve higher levels of growth compared to society society with low trust and low civicness 
uh, according to uh, Nack and Keener 1997 and Temple and Johns 98 provide the evidence that high levels of trust and social participation are positively correlated with economic growth after controlling other growth parameters of the country. Evidence of direct relation between social capital and economic development. One of the research that was conducted by the prestige college Kolkata in 64 countries in which the India is, was also part of that. Uh, it was, uh, the paper was published in uh, 2007. What is states that for each extra one year of education, the trust index improves by 3.2 points and for each additional unit of social trust, economic growth rate rises from 0.04 to 0.07 percent. This suggests that extra year of social schooling may provide additional growth for economy from 0.3 to 0.22 percent through creating trust. As the trust factor increases among the local social capital, so it uh, amounts to the economic growth of the country. And uh, there is a a World Bank initiative, SCI Social Capital Initiative, which conducted six studies and that also relates to that uh, social, uh, mutual benefit uh, re uh, relates to the economic development. One of the example is that was conducted in the Rajasthan village. Uh, in the study conducted in 64 villages Rajasthan for the development of watershed, it was found that villages with, with a high propensity for mutual benefit have done better for themselves not only in the watershed development but in other programs also. How does social capital help in economic development? Uh, it contributes to the economic growth by facilitating collaboration between different uh, individuals like one individual have some skill set, others doesn't have that. So it, it can benefit both the individuals if he provides his support to the other individual and it increases the output of the other individual which will uh, ultimately amount to the economic development of the nation. So caste uh, is termed as a social evil uh, divisive and a curse that must be eradicated if India is to prosper. Uh, but uh, so do you think that is, is it right? Next, uh, but but then why are uh, Gounders, Nadras, Patels, and Marwadis done so well as, as caste uh, in India? Uh, if we think of caste as a vehicle for economic uh, development, then it gives an entirely new perspective to it. Uh, it it gives social capital and also provides cushion to individuals, so which enables them to take extra risk. And also, there's a certain amount of knowledge transfer that happens within the community, which happens uh, so they can, they can learn the best best practices of the business. Uh, in, in the western world, uh, they advocate the individual and which, which isolates him from the society and he has only uh, a layer of uh, his civic rights uh, which save him, but it does not prevail, uh, provide the exact cushion of the caste. Next. Uh, so there are some evils of the caste based system, but they are being destroyed by technology, people struggle uh, and the inter-caste marriages and, and things like that, so people are trying to avoid those things. Uh, a, a, a study shows that out of that 70 percent of India's industrial output and 66 percent of the exports uh, have, have been done through small industries and caste based uh, clusters on which out of, out of which only 13 were government sponsored and rest had evolved through caste and community. Uh, many caste like this have risen as competent entrepreneurs and many at global level uh, mostly uh, leveraging the kinship based uh, social capital. Most of them have, are, are not very well educated, uh, but that does not stop them from doing well. Uh, and uh, Guru, uh, Mr. Gurumurthy's uh, code here is that traditional caste is reinventing its, uh, itself, uh, reorienting itself and seems to be handling mo modernity well, but modernity is not able to handle the caste system. Uh, so uh, we'll share a few examples of this. Uh, for example, uh, the Nadars of uh, Sivkasi, it's a, it's a small town in Tamil Nadu and uh, they are known for the fireworks. So the Nadar caste uh, started the f f with a match factory in 1923 and which later on developed to be a very big fire crack, uh, fireworks uh, hub uh, and uh, till now there are 640 uh, factories in, in one particular region. So that area was not fertile for agriculture and uh, but after they started this uh, Fireworks business there, then uh, it prospered a lot. Which year? So I got this uh, from an article of the Hindu. Which year? So 2013. Uh, so when it comes to caste as a social capital, the biggest success story is Tripur. What was discussed by uh, sir in, in the class also. Thanks. So Tripur is a small town. Tirupur. So Tirupur is a small town located in, in Tamil Nadu near the city of Coimbatore. Its area is 159.6 square kilometers and population is 8.8 .8 lakhs and the literacy rate is more or less about what the, what is the literacy rate of India. So how the textile industry started developing in Tirupur. 
so it was first initially uh, it was a center of trading uh, cotton trading a few de decades ago and then they started making banyans of west uh, and some of the units got established the proximity to coimbatore was the main helping in establishing itself as a textile and, and textile manufacturing and trading center so in early 1980s what they decided what they did was they from banyans they moved to the manufacturing of colored t-shirts and then from then the industry of textile started uh, booming so ex they started exporting it to other other countries especially it started with it it started with italy and then they soon moved to other european countries and in 1990s the tirupur exporters association was formed with the aim to establish tirupur as a vibrant global exporter of knitwear uh, so present situ uh, situation of the industry so it it shows the graph shows that how, how the industry once started exporting from 1984 how the number uh, exports turnover is increasing year on year so that is till 2015 and here it is estimated like the 16 data is not available still and from year 5 to uh, 2005 to 2018 it is estimated to have a average growth rate of 12.6% so right now it contributes to 80% of the india hosiery exports and 3% of the total uh, export trade garments are exported to almost all the countries of the world from us to south america and japan uh, and right now i'm mean, now tirupur has started exporting not only cottons knitwear but also manufacturing swimwear and sportswear and the government of india has recently named it as a town of export excellence so how it started how the this industry uh, grown to has became successful so tirupur is uh, mainly the main caste which was present over there was gondors gondors and they had they had the entrepreneurship spirit among themselves so it was a community which was found in the it is a community which is found in the western region of tamil nadu relegated to land based activities and relying on family based network so it is known that uh, uh, knitted knitted garment industry is a capital intensive and initially the state was not able to provide the capital so they started generating capital within their family networks labor was also mobilized in the similar way and how it happens was what was like workers which were good in manufacturing uh, knitwear used to uh, Uh, form tie ties with their other family members who were who had capital and thus started forming manufacturing units another route was dowry uh, was though it was dowry but here the son in law apart from uh, money used to get some buyers in form of his really in form of his re form of his relatives who used to buy the garments from him another model which they practiced though is not practiced right now it was prominent in 1970s and 80s was the gratis capital in which in this some big firms used to uh, ask all the they they standing uh, workers to leave the company and start their own manufacturing units to help them the second hand machinery was provided and also they were provided the initial places to start the uh, operation so this is how the tirupur textile industry started growing and right now it is, as i have showed that right now it contributes 3% of the total export trade of india Oh, uh, we will discuss the diamond uh, diamond business success story in India. So let let us first discuss the history of diamond business. It the history of diamond business dates back to 1880s uh, when it was started by Surajmal uh, uh, Mr. Surajmal Lalu Chand uh, Lalu Bhai and uh, Amruk Ch uh, Amruk Bhai uh, from uh, they came from the town of Palanpur and they expanded their business to the towns of uh, Bombay, Calcutta, and Rangoon. Earlier. The the trade was restricted to the polishing of the uh, uh, rough uh, rough diamond coming from the um, Amit Amit Yeran city uh, in in northern Gujarat, but later it was expanded to out, uh, outside India also when the multi rate import replacement scheme was allowed. Uh, it it happened in 1970s and during that time Marwadis also come into into the picture. Uh, Marwadis from Rajasthan had already an experience with the precious stones polishing of precious stones. but most of the most of them came for the monetary purposes uh, in the 1970s workshop were quickly set up in surat navsari and other inland centers uh, to support the support and promote the export of gems and jewelry in india gem and jewelry export promotion council was set up uh, this is the present st statistics australia is the largest diamond producer india is the largest diamond processor of the rough diamonds and uh, usa is the largest diamond market Uh, coming to the present uh, scenario of the industry we can see uh, the exports export value of diamond has been continuously increasing from 2005 to 2015 and uh, this is the split up of where the indian diamond uh, uh, di in the polish indian diamond goes uh, the largest user is the hong kong followed by other users 
so uh, more in india more than 80% of the world's uh, diamond is polished cut or polished and it has been total export has been increasing by uh, by a rate of 11.2% from 2004-5 to 2014-15 and it's 60% of global market share by volume and 80% by volume and 90% of the uh, workers are indians uh, uh, before coming to the uh, story of how it became successful first we need to understand how it works diamond industry works totally on the uh, credit basis it works on the community network that you have developed uh, while doing businesses so uh, coming to the story of how it became successful initially it, it was uh, operated by uh, panuplals and uh, marwadis but then uh, uh, there was an ex exogenous increase in the uh, supply of rough diamonds which were not handled by the current industry uh, current setup of the diamond market so uh, uh, kathiwariyas which are which are patel Kathia Varis come into the picture, which are in, which were initially farmers from Saurashtra, Northern Gujarat, and they have migrated to Surat to work as laborers in diamond industry. But due to increase sudden increase in the rough uh, uh, supply of the rough diamonds, they they got an opportunity to come into the picture and they started uh, managing the business and trading the business. So Palanpuri business. Uh, so the Katiawari's entrance took advantage of this opportunity to bring other members of their community into the business, providing connections to rough suppliers in Antiva. Uh, one major factor also co comes into the picture is the marriage factor. They, they uh, mostly in India there is caste system which believe in uh, marriage in the same caste. So over here it helps in increase of the of their network and it helps in increasing their business in that way, so that they have more access to the uh, credit base credit base network. Uh, this is the uh, rough diamond imports in India by volume and uh, uh, I guess the, I will correct this but this is by uh, by value and uh, sir I have replicated the same graph by mistake it I will change it it, it was by value by volume and by value <laughs> and uh, this is the diamond exports by country 20% of the world diamond is being exported by India we are polishing but uh, but we have lot of demand inside India only. So we are exporting only 20%. So now we will see the role, role of caste or community. As per, uh, as per the recent data that is 2015, the services sector contribute to 57% of the GDP. And the share of non-corporate sector in service, for example there are different uh, there are different divisions in service sector like that uh, non rail transport, the hotels etc. On uh, for uh, of them, see, on an average, sixty-two percent is the share of non-corporate sector, and in uh, and the funding in this non-corporate sector is done by domestic saving. So the non-corporate sectors consist of the tiny, small, and medium enterprises, and categorized by partnership and proprietorship. These are primarily held by families or extended families, uh, and the role of caste or community in financing marketing is very important in this kind of sector. Now, uh, this is the data that we have got from uh, the census. Uh, the uh, in uh, uh, MSME sector, the social groups such as SC, ST, and OBC, in all over India, you can see they earn, uh, they own 45.87 percent uh, of the total entrepreneurs that OBC own, and uh, SC, ST own up to 11 percent and 5 percent. So this shows that uh, as a social group, they have excelled. So uh, the enterprise survey also reveals that uh, 90 percent of these were found to be self-financing and it came from informal caste networks and the number of establishment financed were only 4% so uh, the, the data that uh, that we the recent data that we could found from the census or 2013 and 14 that out of the uh, total establishment in handicraft and uh, handlooms 47.6% was owned by obcs and out of the women entrepreneurs maximum were owned by obcs as you can see is uh, 41 nearly 41% now, uh, was there a discrimination in education? In the uh, in the as as many are claiming that there was a discrimination in education in caste system, but uh, this is a data by Dharampal, and he showed that uh, pre pre 1900, that is in 1800, if you see the share of Shudras in school, it was it was majorly the share of Shudras in all the school. That is in Tamil speaking school, it was 80 percent. In uh, Oriya areas, it was 62 percent, and in Telugu areas, it was up to 50 percent. Now, the, now we'll uh, see the role of clusters. So, clusters, as we have seen, it plays a, uh, a significant role in economic 
scene of India. The Ministry of Scale and Industries Government uh, has established that there are around 2042 clusters of which 1223 are in the registered sector in 26 states and another 18, uh, 819 are in unregistered sectors. Now the examples, we have uh, given different examples, there are many examples as uh, Shankaragiri uh, transport cluster in Tamil Nadu, uh, Morvi in Gujarat, uh, Rajkot in Gujarat, Jalandhar in Punjab and Coimbatore as well. So these are the different clusters where they have excelled as a business. Now caste as a social, uh, social capital, so caste has played a significant role in the contribution of business in India particularly in the last 50 years or so. And the economic development has taken place through partnership of properties activities as well. It has also played a, a growth, uh, it has also played a major uh, role in our growth process and it has not been adequately, uh, uh, adequately recognized. Swami Vivekananda also said that the older I grow, the better I seem to think that these, these time honored institution of India, there was a time when I used to think that many of them were useless and, birth, uh, and worthless. But the older I grow, the more I seem to feel a difference in cursing any one of them for each one of them has a, a diffidence in cursing any one of them for each one of them has an embodiment of experience of centuries. So he just wanted to say that even if there are these systems are present in India, but they have an experience uh, uh, culture of their own which has contributed to India as well. So thank you. I think it was a very good interesting presentation. Only one line I would like to add is you would know that day before yesterday was World Health Day and depression was the focal point because depression has been rising all over the world but not so much rising in India.